Thanks so much, Zander, for the introduction. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the presentation. Uh, my name is Henok uh, Asfal. Uh, I'm a postdoc and a project manager for the First Nation Wildfire Evacuation Partnership Project uh, at the University of Alberta. Uh, a partnership is uh, led by Dr. Tara uh, <clears throat> So first of all, uh, on behalf of the First Nation Wildfire Evacuation Partnership, uh, I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, Southwest Fire Science Consortium for giving us the opportunity to present our work in this very important webinar. Uh, so in this presentation, uh, I am going to present and discuss the results from our uh, recently published book uh, uh, titled First Nation Wildfire Evacuation, a guide uh, for communities and external agencies. So as you, as you know, the book is authored by Dr. Tara McGee and uh, Dr. Amy Christensen with uh, First Nation Wildfire Evacuation Partnership. Just to uh, introduce the, the authors, Dr. Tara McGee is a professor in the Department of Air and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta. Uh, Dr. Amy Christensen is a METI researcher. Uh, uh, she's a fire scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, probably she'll be here joining us uh, Today, she'll be addressing probably some of your questions in the uh, Q&A session later. Uh, <clears throat> so in this presentation, like I said, I'll be giving you like uh, an overview of, uh, uh, generally an overview of uh, about the book, especially for, for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to read it. Uh, so just walking through the main topics and findings, and then uh, uh, I will, leave uh, the, the floor for the discussion later on. So uh, we'll <clears throat> hopefully we'll have a, a discussion session. Uh, so first uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the land we are living in. Uh, so the University of Alberta, and we live in Treaty 6 territory and the Métis Nation of Alberta Zone 4. I respectfully acknowledge that this is a traditional territory of First Nations and uh, Métis people who have stewarded these lands uh, since time immemorial. I'm continuing on my learning journey as a treaty person, part of which has been the research that I'll be presenting today. Um, so uh, in this presentation, uh, first I, I will uh, give you a brief uh, background about uh, generally about wildfire and wildfire evacuation in Canada uh, with reference to indigenous communities uh, and uh, talk about uh, the research aim and methods uh, used uh, in the research process. And then finally, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, coming sessions, I will discuss uh, findings uh, as outlined in, uh, along the six main topics uh, discussed in the, in the book. So now, uh, brief uh, background. So uh, on average uh, in Canada, uh, 8,400 wildfires burn uh, over two to four million hectares of forest every year uh, in Canada. So the majority of these wildfires uh, occur in the boreal uh, forest region. So uh, wildfire evacuation database uh, compiled by the Canadian Forest Service uh, showed that between 1980 to 2021, uh, current year, uh, uh, there were 1,368 wildfire evacuation events uh, in Canada. So out of these uh, events, almost closely one third of the evacuation incidents involved uh, First Nation communities. Uh, this is obviously, in fact, a disproportionate uh, impact on indigenous people, uh, despite uh, comprising 4.9% of the Canadian population. So, well, the Canadian constitution identifies three indigenous uh, uh, groups, uh, First Nation, Miti, and Inuit. So uh, in this research, we are focusing uh, on uh, First Nations. Um, <clears throat> so why First Nations? Uh, uh, so many First Nations are at risk of wildfire. Uh, this is mainly primarily due to their location. Uh, so uh, like I said, most of them, most of these communities are located in the boreal forests. Uh, <clears throat> for example, the Canadian Forest Service uh, has reported that 60% of the 3,100 reserves uh, either lie within or intersect the wildland urban interface where communities are at high risk from wildfire uh, because of uh, proximity to the 
I did uh, rural uh, forest, and yet, and uh, many of these communities are remote uh, and isolated. Uh, for example, 114 reserves uh, identified by Assembly of First Nations as having no or limited road access. So this kind of uh, increases their vulnerability as well. Uh, just to uh, give you uh, an overview about this year's uh, evacuation incident, uh, this past summer, as you may know, uh, was a really bad year. We all have seen small fires in the wrong place uh, can cause a lot of people to be evacuated. So this map shows uh, uh, reported evacuation locations as of August 31st, 2021. Uh, the orange circle in particular show uh, evacuation occurrences in places with greater than 50% of indigenous, indigenous population, so the larger the, the circle uh, in those places, the higher the number of evacuees. Uh, example, largest circle uh, indicate evacuation incid incidents involving greater than 1,000 people. So overall, uh, this year, for example, uh, British Columbia had the largest number of evacuees, uh, followed by Manitoba, and then there, uh, and uh, third in Ontario. Uh, so in Ontario, there were six First Nation communities that were evacuated this year. So this is just to give you uh, a background that indigenous communities continue to be affected by wildfires. Um, uh, so just give you a little bit of uh, a, um, an overview about the, uh, the First Nation Wildfire Evacuation Partnership. Uh, so the partnership was initiated uh, in 2013 by Dr. Tara McGee uh, and Amy Christensen, uh, Dr. Amy Christensen. So uh, they eventually recruited two graduate students, uh, uh, one PhD student, myself, and another uh, master's student. Um, it officially started in 2013 uh, when funding was secured from Social Science and Humanities Research Council. So the overall goal of the partnership was to explore First Nations wildfire evacuation experiences and identify uh, factors that affected evacuation experiences in positive and negative ways and uh, uh, recommend ways to reduce uh, negative impacts of wildfire evacuation. This was a primary goals of the partnership. So the seven First Nations uh, were involved in the research uh, along with uh, uh, 12 government and non-governmental organizations. Uh, as uh, partner, uh, research partners. Uh, so uh, with regard to the First Nation, the study communities, uh, because the 2011 wildfires uh, caused the evacuation of many First Nation in Ontario, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, we focused on these three provinces uh, and initially identified six uh, First Nations that had been evacuated. Uh, in Ontario, uh, we have a uh, Mishkigomang First Nation, uh, Sa uh, Sand Lake First Nation, and Deer Lake First Nation. Uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, we have Onion Lake First Nation, uh, and in Alberta, Whitefish Lake First Nation and Delta First Nation. Uh, one year into our research, in 2014, uh, Lac La Ronge Indian Band, uh, Stalin Mission Reserve in Saskatchewan was evacuated, so we invited them to join uh, the partnership, and they agreed bringing uh, the number to uh, the number of participating communities to seven. So uh, these are the research committees. Just to give you a, a little bit of background about the communities, I'll start with uh, the communities in Ontario. So in, in Ontario, we have uh, three research communities, uh, Mishki Gigomang. Uh, so this community, uh, the one at the bottom, uh, uh, green dot. So this community, uh, during the evacuation uh, back in 2011, it had like 1,900 uh, 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 band members. 74% of the band members uh, speak Ojibwe, Ojibwe, Ojibwe sorry, uh, at home. So Mishki Gogomang was fully evacuated during the 2011 evacuation. The whole community was uh, evacuated. Uh, and uh, moving up north, uh, um, the Deer Lake First Nation is an, another. Uh, uh, it's a flying community, uh, no road access. Uh, and uh, uh, during the evacuation, uh, it had a band member of 1,100. Uh, the community was partially evacuated during the same fire season. Uh, uh, another community close to Deer Lake, it's Sandy Lake First Nation. It's a flying community uh, again. So uh, Sandy 
Lake First Nation, uh, during the evacuation, it had uh, an estimated only reserve population of 2,800. Uh, uh, probably now the, the Sand Lake is, uh, I think the, it is the largest uh, flying community in Northwestern Ontario. Uh, its population is more than 3,000 now. Uh, so <clears throat> like Deer Lake, uh, people in Sand Lake also speak uh, Oji, Ojikri. Uh, in 2011, the community was fully evacuated. Uh, close to 2,800 people. Uh, so these, these are the, the, our partners in Ontario. So moving to Saskatchewan, uh, sorry about the quality of the map. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, so I, we, like I said, we have two research partners in Saskatchewan, uh, Onion Lake Cree Nation and uh, Lac La Ronge Indian Band. So Onion Lake uh, uh, Cree Nation straddles the border between Saskatchewan and Alberta. Yeah, they are located in Treaty 6 territory. Uh, Cree is the first language in Onion Lake, and a portion of Onion Lake was evacuated due to uh, wildfires in 2012 and uh, 2013, uh, consecutive years. Uh, Lac La Ronge Indian Band, uh, it is uh, located uh, uh, in north central Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, during the evacuation, uh, there were uh, about 1,650 uh, pop, uh, band, uh, band size, population size. Uh, it's a road access community. Uh, Cree is the first language uh, in the community. And Stanley Mission was fully evacuated in 2014 and 2015 due to, uh, due to wildfires. Uh, so this Stanley Mission is one particular reserve uh, within the larger Lac La Ronge, uh, uh, Lac -La -Ronge Indian Band. Uh, so moving to uh, Alberta. Uh, we have uh, three research communities there. Uh, first one is uh, <clears throat> the Den Deneta First Nation. Uh, it is located northwest, uh, northwestern Alberta in Treaty 6 territory. Uh, many of the Deneta uh, inhibit three of seven reserve, uh, reserves located near the town of High Level. Uh, Deneta First Nation uh, had about 2,900 population. Uh, so the community of Tashi, uh, which is a focus of this study, had a population of approximately 400 people. Uh, so the majority of data speak Dene as their first language. So in 2012, Tashi was partially evacuated, uh, evacuated due to heavy wildfire smoke. Uh, another community in central Alberta, uh, north central Alberta, is uh, Whitefish Lake First Nation. So Whitefish Lake uh, First Nation, it is accessible by road. Uh, uh, it, uh, during the evacuation, it had uh, around 2,600 population. Uh, uh, so more than half of the population speak Cree. Uh, the community was fully evacuated uh, uh, in the 2011 wildfire season. So these are the uh, study communities. So with regard to our research uh, method, uh, so we follow qualitative research method. Uh, uh, we employed a community-based approach. So after seeking permission from First Nation leadership, chief and council, uh, uh, together with uh, community research assistants, we completed more than 200 semi-structured interview. So the largest group of uh, interview participants were evacuees. Uh, during the interview, we asked about their experience, uh, starting from when they first heard about the, or saw about the fire, the evacuation process, leaving their community, staying in the host community, returning home and lasting effect of the evacuation. So the whole, uh, uh, whole stage of uh, the evacuation process. So we also interviewed community leaders and also uh, people who stayed behind. Uh, so in terms of demographics, we pretty much covered uh, a wide range of uh, participants, uh, elders, youth, uh, uh, women, so uh, diverse range of uh, uh, demographics. So uh, in terms of uh, data analysis, we followed a uh, qualitative thematic analysis. Um, so the results from each uh, case study committee has been published in uh, different uh, journal articles, reports. So this uh, book is a uh, final result that brings together all the case studies. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so the book uh, is uh, organized in six main uh, topics, uh, chapters. Um, 
So in general, uh, it offered a detailed account of uh, what happened, uh, what can happen and what should happen during the six stages of uh, an evacuation uh, process. So in doing so, it offers step step by step guide uh, to developing an evacuation plan and carrying it out from how to decide to evacuate to what to do when community members finally return home. So it's sort of uh, 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 help as a guideline as well for not only, it's not only a purely academic uh, uh, academic uh, book. Uh, it also helps to you know for uh, pretty much uh, can help for uh, practitioners you know emergency responders. So um, so that's the way it is uh, structured. Uh, so just to. Uh, give you to uh, outline some of the findings uh, in the book. Uh, the first one is the decision making uh, process. There are two main topics discussed in this section, fire detection and uh, decision making process. So with regard to fire detection uh, for many uh, Northern First Nation communities, uh, wildfire uh, and smoke sighting can occur multiple times a summer because of the frequency of uh, fire in the boreal forest. So often it is difficult uh, to know when one of these wildfires can become a hazard to the community and responding in an appropriate way isn't always straightforward. For example, uh, during the 2011 wildfires, uh, some, con some communities like for instance, wild, uh, Whitefish Lake spot uh, a fire and evacuate quickly within hours. Uh, others, uh, uh, watched fire, you know, what watched the fire and smoke uh, linger for weeks. Uh, the weather changes and uh, uh, winds shift direction. Uh, for example, in northern Ontario, uh, uh, during the same fire season, multiple communities were threatened uh, by wildfire. Uh, some of these communities, like for example, Deer Lake, uh, had to declare a state of emergency immediately. Uh, by contrast, uh, Sand Lake First Nation, which is located uh, 70 kilometers to north of uh, Deer Lake didn't consider the wildfire as an immediate threat. So many residents later told us that uh, they noticed fire activity and smoke for about two weeks before the evacuation. Uh, so what we learned each time a First Nation experienced a wildfire near its community, uh, residents face uh, a potential for uh, an evacuation. Uh, but again, not knowing for or when a state of emergency and evacuation will be called only enhances their stress and uh, anxiety. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> with regard to uh, the decision uh, to evacuate, uh, so in First Nation community, uh, the decision to evacuate ultimately uh, rests on with the chief and council, uh, band council, uh, but it is never straightforward. Uh, it typically unfolds in three stage. Uh, Assessing the risk, consulting with outside agencies, and determining the nature and scope of the evacuation. These are pretty much the stages uh, uh, in, this, in the decision making process. So, uh, with regard to identifying the risk, it is often difficult for chief and councils uh, to assess risk because uh, the course of wildfire cannot be predicted. They often rely on uh, personal observation. Uh, how far can I see? Does it seem bad? Is it uh, hard to breathe, sometimes the risk will become immediately apparent. Often they make, uh, they must make this decision about without the help of scientific information or outside experts, particularly if multiple communities are uh, uh, being evacuated. Uh, like the case, uh, one uh, typical case we uh, examined was a uh, uh, 2011 wildfire evacuation in Northern Ontario where multiple communities were involved. Uh, at the same time in evacuation. So it was hard for some of the committees to get uh, uh, you know, clear and timely and site-specific information with regard to the, the wildfire. So sometimes decision to evacuate is a complicated process and uh, it, 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 it causes uh, stress, uh, uh, tremendous stress for committee leaders and reasons. So provided there is time, uh, the chief or council will, cons will consult with outside agencies at the local, provincial and uh, federal level. Each province and territory in Canada have uh, its own uh, agreements, uh, legislation and policies that influence how it provides support to First Nations uh, during the wildfire evacuation. So jurisdictional complexities are one of the main factors um, outlined in the book uh, affecting uh, um, the decision, decision-making process uh, in particular. Uh, 
uh, chief and band, band councillors should know, for example, which external agencies uh, to consult and which regional fire centers they are in, and everyone involved should be familiar with the protocols of their uh, province. Uh, so when it comes to the consultation process, uh, chief and uh, council may decide that the, tra the threat to health and well-being doesn't yet warrant uh, an evacuation order. So in this case, uh, they have two choices, uh, either issue an evacuation alert or call a voluntary evacuation. Uh, evacuation alert, uh, once committee members that an evacuation order may be coming, uh, where, whereas uh, a call for a voluntary evacuation means that residents can decide whether they wish to stay or, uh, or leave. Uh, however, um, once it is uh, determined that the risk to health and safety of the committee are high enough to warrant a mandatory evacuation, the chief must first declare, declare a state of emergency. Uh, so a mandatory evacuation cannot be called without this action, uh, which also trigger uh, the ability to obtain emergency funding from uh, provincial or federal government, depending on the agreement in place. So once a state of emergency is called, uh, chief and council must then decide whether to issue a partial evacuation or a full evacuation. So usually a partial evacuation order uh, uh, involves residents with uh, a high risk or high risk uh, from smoke. A full evacuation is uh, for all community members. Um, however, in our study, we found cases in which uh, such emergency management protocols were not properly communicated between committees and uh, uh, external agencies. Uh, probably, uh, as you can read from uh, this quote on the screen, uh, a committee chief in one of the study areas, uh, in, the, in one of the uh, case studies, uh, they told us that uh, they were not aware of these protocols, which eventually created uh, misunderstanding and confusion. So the whole message here is that uh, having clarity in uh, roles and protocols and you know, proper knowledge and communication about it is a key for uh, responding to uh, emergency uh, uh, situations. Um, so uh, uh, the, the second stage, uh, second chapter in this case is uh, it's about putting plan in motion. Uh, this is when uh, the affected community attempt to mobilize resource. Uh, to organize a response phase, uh, which is uh, organizing and coordinating the evacuation uh, process. So in putting plan in motion at this stage, uh, 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 one of the things we found was that uh, absence of uh, up-to-date evacuation plan uh, was one of the issues uh, influencing evacuation uh, experiences at both individual and community level. Uh, so in our uh, case study committees, uh, uh, we found uh, most committees lacked uh, up-to-date evacuation plan to carry out uh, uh, and coordinate uh, evacuation, uh, the evacuation process. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the participants we interviewed uh, who had a management role during the evacuation uh, indicated that the lack of an evacuation plan contributed to the challenges and the problems encountered in the course of the evacuation, which uh, was uh, outlined uh, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, in my presentation shortly. So, um, for example, to mention one uh, in Deneta, uh, it's one study committee in Alberta. So to, co to carry out the uh, partial evacuation, the emergency director followed a generic emergency plan uh, provi uh, provided by the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, uh, which had not be formally tailored to Deneta uh, First Nation or its main three reserves. So the use of a generic plan is one area we outlined uh, as having a problem in coordinating evacuation plans. So communities need to have a, their own tailored uh, evacuation plan. Uh, Sand Lake, same community, um, uh, same uh, faced same problem. Uh, it's a flying community uh, in Northern Ontario. So they didn't have an evacuation plan to coordinate the full evacuation of more than 2,800 band members. Uh, instead, the chief uh, and the team he set up uh, to make decisions to lead and coordinate uh, uh, the evacuation, you know, uh, of uh, the community in three days uh, of time. Uh, so this this community in particular had to had to be evacuated uh, uh, with uh, you know military airplanes. So uh, there is no other access route uh, for uh, evacuation. Uh, 
so overall, none of the seven uh, partner of First Nation had their full-time emergency management uh, manager responsible for preparing and updating plans. This was a problem we uh, found also. In some cases, uh, emergency management roles and uh, were not assigned, such as the for like for example uh, for different tasks like community liaisons uh, uh, high-risk individuals were not identified oftentimes residents were not informed about how long they must prepare and what was what they should take with them and where they should go so all this uh, the, all these things were supposed to you know uh, kind of sort out in uh, emergency management plan so in a flying community uh, where residents had to live in stages uh, like uh, I mentioned previously, this also creates a problem uh, because uh, uh, there has to be a list that identify uh, residents who should be evacuated at stage one, vulnerable communities or high-risk communities, and then uh, for the rest of the community. So this uh, had to be uh, planned prior to the fire season. Um, so with regard to... Uh, uh, Transportation, evacuation, transportation, transportation. This is the third uh, chapter uh, in the book, uh, uh, troubleshooting transportation. Uh, so in our case studies, issues occurred uh, during the evacuation, all of the, the case study committees uh, with regard to transportation. So there are two area, uh, uh, two, uh, uh, the, the encountered at this stage uh, depends whether the committee is, uh, depending on the committee context, whether it's a road access, or a flying community. So in terms of road access uh, committee, uh, uh, as I noted earlier, uh, except two First Nation, all the study committees are, access where ac are accessible by road. Although for many, it is a single gravel road that may, poor that may be poorly maintained. So uh, in the absence of a well thought out plan, residents can encounter problems such as, for example, lack of vehicle, gas related issues, uncertainties about destinations, uh, these are some of the main problems we found out with regard to road access communities. In uh, in a multi-stage evacuation by air uh, in, in flying community context, uh, for example, um, uh, so overall uh, coordinate, um, uh, the evacuation of flying community require a massive coordinated effort uh, uh, and uh, plan. So uh, the problem encountered in flying communities could, could also be even more uh, uh, complicated. Uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, let's take the Sandy Lake First Nation uh, uh, as an example of this community suggest. Flying community typically need to be evacuated in stages, uh, so uh, which can pose uh, multiple transportation problem. Some of the problem uh, with regard to transportation, for example, uh, lack of transportation to the airport. Some communities may not have like uh, 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 transportation to the airport where they will be airlifted uh, and evacuated. And also uh, military Hercules are uh, uncomfortable for some evacuees. Uh, some have fear of flying uh, or limited experience of flying. These are, this is a problem also with regard to uh, transportation, one thing we found. Uh, once they leave, uh, some uh, evacuees had to wait at airport hangar, sometimes overnight, uh, before moving on to a second location, sometimes even a third location. So, um, especially when multiple communities are involved in evacuation, such as as we uh, found out in uh, Northern Ontario uh, evacuation cases, uh, some of the pre-identified host communities might be filled up. So there could be a shortage of uh, host communities. Uh, so um, sometimes uh, residents may not know where they, where, the, where, they, where, the, where they are heading or not knowing about the ultimate destination is a problem. For some uh, residents, you can imagine how uh, this causes uh, stress uh, for evacuees. Uh, so as you can see from the quotes on the screen, uh, one of the quotes uh, uh, explain the challenges with the military Hercules, as explained by one of the residents in the second one is a problem associated with, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, being transferred to, uh, um, uh, to 
uh, to host committee where it serves as a hub and then before moving to the second uh, to, to the second host community. So these are the problems encountered in the process uh, and uh, uh, in the, with regard to uh, uh, transportation. So once uh, uh, evacuees uh, settle, uh, sorry, uh, this map uh, shows um, uh, one uh, specific example of Sand Lake First Nation in Northern Ontario. Uh, like I said, it's a flying community. So the community had to, had to be evacuated to more than you know about 12 communities uh, in Ontario and in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So the community was pretty much scattered and there was family separation problem uh, that uh, uh, encountered in the process uh, because uh, the community had to live uh, in stages, uh, uh, stage one and stage two and this sort of uh, uh, created problem because uh, some family members had to be, you know, split uh, in the process, um, uh, and keeping family together was uh, was a challenge because uh, uh, there wasn't a well thought out plan at the time. So this is a typical example of the <clears throat> transportation and the hosting uh, uh, problem. So once uh, uh, once evacuees arrive at the host community. Uh, Accommodation, food, and other services need to be provided. So, Chapter Four deals about uh, this uh, aspect. Uh, accommodation for evacuees uh, uh, is organized by the host community, and it may include, you know, hotel, uh, evacuation centers, or uh, other temporary places that have uh, facilities suitable for uh, housing people during uh, an evacuation, such as uh, school rooms, uh, gymnasiums, or recreation and uh, community centers. Uh, the option can vary from province to province or from community to community. Uh, for example, in Alberta, evacuation centers are less commonly where uh, the preference is to have people stay in hotel rooms. In Saskatchewan, uh, most evacuees stay in centers run by the Red Cross, uh, the Red Cross. Uh, and in Ontario, by contrast, evacuees stay in a mix of hotel rooms and uh, evacuation centers. So depending on the province, the arrangement vary. Uh, so as a, as a result of uh, our study uh, showed, addressing accommodation in line with the specific needs of uh, the evacuees uh, is one of the challenges uh, in the host uh, communities, because uh, <clears throat> as you can read from, uh, uh, from the slide in the screen, there are pros and cons for each type of accom accommodations. I will not be discussing all uh, here uh, for the sake of saving time. Uh, just to uh, mention the case of evacuation centers, however, uh, while it is advantageous uh, in the sense that it offers a lot of home ev evacuation centers, large evacuation centers, uh, if provided that if uh, space are uh, kept to a minimum for evacuees, but the overall problem that uh, people face is overcrowding, for instance, and lack of privacy and un uncomfortable courts are some of the downsides, especially for elders and uh, uh, medically vulnerable <coughs> uh, evacuees. Uh, uh, so um, the chapter, uh, the chapter, the next chapter uh, five uh, extends the discussion uh, on the provision of service and facilities at the host communities, uh, mainly like food, uh, healthcare needs, uh, or support, provision of information and activities and recreation for evacuees. So, um, uh, so uh, with regard to food, uh, I will not be addressing all this, uh, but just to mention food uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, inform the need for information. Uh, with regard to uh, food, uh, so. With, uh, organi one thing organizers should keep in mind that uh, food is an important uh, part of indigenous culture uh, uh, across Canada. Uh, indigenous culture for uh, for uh, 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 an important uh, part of indigenous culture. Uh, so many First Nation people, including elders, uh, rely on traditional food. Some evacuees uh, we interviewed said uh, they miss traditional food. Uh, so adapting to meal condition is one of the challenges uh, while they are while they uh, are evacuated to larger larger towns and cities. Uh, but we found also positive instances where uh, uh, 
nearby First Nation communities or indigenous uh, residents uh, help uh, in providing traditional food, you know, in cooking uh, uh, traditional food, which uh, help uh, smooth uh, their eva the, the negative or uh, stressful evacuation experiences. Uh, this uh, gesture of committees uh, it shows uh, 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 how community support and collaboration can uh, help uh, ease stresses uh, while staying in the host community. Uh, <clears throat> uh, with regard to the need for uh, information, uh, one thing uh, we found is evacuees want to uh, and need to receive accurate and timely information about the uh, safety of their homes, uh, uh, communities, and uh, families when they are living in a host community. Uh, in this case, for example, community members who stay behind in evacuated communities. Uh, including members of the community leadership, uh, firefighters or other residents can be important source of information. Uh, evacuees were worrying about their houses, pets, uh, other possession was a common theme uh, we found uh, in the interview. So uh, with regard to information sharing, the host community, uh, as our case studies found, because of difficulties using uh, official information sources, if a, if a quiz turned to community websites, social media, and uh, calling other community members to find family members. Um, one particular example is uh, use of uh, you know, closed Facebook, Facebook groups uh, for uh, sharing of information, uh, which, which, is, which we found uh, uh, helpful during the evacuation, although it tends to be, uh, although there are also downsides. Uh, uh, in using this, uh, uh, this, this, this media uh, sources. Uh, so uh, the final <clears throat> stage of uh, the evacuation uh, process is uh, returning home process, the repatriation of uh, uh, the community. So uh, this chapter in general uh, emphasizes, uh, so once evacuees return, community leaders and members of uh, outside agencies should be uh, aware that the evacuee's fate could linger uh, in individual and community memories uh, for weeks uh, and nine months and even years. Uh, uh, community members uh, will need assistance financially and uh, emotionally. Some individuals will experience uh, severe anxiety at the sight of or smell of smoke. Uh, some bands will struggle to deal with uh, financial repercussions uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, in our cases, for example, there are certain communities who uh, struggle to, you know, <clears throat> uh, deal with reimbursement processes uh, with, uh, you know, depending on the different jurisdictional uh, locations they are found. Uh, so some First Nation and individuals experience significant delay in recovering costs. Uh, so these are some of the problems we uh, we found uh, actually there has there has been changes uh, since then uh, 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 that we uh, noted since uh, uh, since this research was uh, uh, conducted. But uh, th these are some of the issues uh, outlined uh, uh, as a key uh, to uh, at this stage of the evacuation, which is a, a re repatriation process. So I think uh, I have. Uh, gone through almost um, touched uh, major areas uh, uh, discussed in, uh, in the book. Uh, hopefully you, uh, you'll find more information uh, in, uh, in the book. So uh, probably we will uh, have more discussion in the Q&A session. So thank you so much uh, for uh, listening and uh, I'll open the floor to discussion now. Great. Well, th thank you so much, Hanuk. Uh, it's really great to kind of get this, this overview. And uh, <clears throat> let's see. So I'm going to go back a couple of things um, that have come into the chat window here and feel free to uh, uh, add more. And we have a relatively small group so um, folks can unmute themselves and speak up if they'd like. And so Marty asked, uh, can you speak about what is being done around communities to avoid the need to evacuate? So I know this is not necessarily your specialty, Hanuk, but obviously it's part of the whole picture. So is there something you wanna add on that front, the sort of fuel treatments or other mitigation measures? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, I think uh, 
this is one of the policy you know, debate area, uh, as, as you can, uh, as you know. So evacuation as a policy is the main strategy in Northern America, I think uh, it's, it's also in US. So it's the main strategy, fire suppression and uh, evacuation is a main strategy in wildfire management uh, as a mainstream, uh, as a mainstream strategy. Uh, but there are also debates, uh, I think, from uh, uh, researchers and practitioners' uh, perspective, to come up with alternative uh, alternatives uh, to evacuation. Um, yeah, uh, so there is debate, ongoing debate on whether uh, to keep communities, you know, in a shelter in uh, in uh, in uh, in their communities, but uh, it's not yet uh, uh, a policy area here. But uh, there is a debate here. But uh, uh, stay, it's staying, staying. I mean, in a shelter, uh, it has also its own uh, uh, advantage and uh, disadvantage. Uh, it's sometimes uh, it's also risky. Uh, but that's one option. And um, probably uh, the other major areas that uh, increasingly researchers uh, advocate is uh, mitigation piece, uh, like you uh, suggested, like you mentioned. Uh, so um, community level fire smart mitigation, as, uh, uh, fire smart mitigation initiatives nowadays is uh, is increasingly being advocated in many areas. Uh, one, one, one area is an uh, initiative uh, introduced by Fire Smart Canada. So um, there are pilot communities, First Nation communities nowadays being uh, used as a, um, uh, as a, you know, as a pilot uh, community for, you know, uh, doing mitigation, uh, community level mitigation as, uh, uh, activities, like for instance, uh, use of fire break, uh, fa uh, and uh, vegetation uh, uh, management activities uh, and you know fire smart construction uh, fire smart housing all these are you know part of uh, part of uh, the initiative to reduce uh, people's uh, exposure uh, to wildfire risk and there is also uh, smoke smoke is the main challenge uh, uh, for many first nation communities not a direct uh, threat from fire but uh, smoke is um, the main challenge. So, um, having a you know a smoke protection, uh, um, smoke filter uh, in houses, you know, uh, small uh, um, uh, facilities equipped with smoke filter, you know, as a way of uh, minimizing risk is also being suggested. But uh, still, evacuation is the main the main strategy being used uh, as a main policy area. Great. Uh, I'm not sure if I address the question. <laughs> well, it's, it's clearly it's a uh, almost a question for a whole other webinar. So I, I think great job in kind of connecting the dots. Um, I guess um, maybe we'll turn to a, a question from uh, Kat uh, Edgley. Um, do you get a sense of how transferable these findings are to First Nations affected by other related hazards? And she's thinking of the post-fire flooding that we're seeing in British Columbia at the moment. Uh, I, I think this is a good a good question. Um, this this um, overall uh, uh, the uh, you know the hazard 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 share similar characteristics, right? Like the emergency situation is similar, uh, whether it is wildfire and uh, uh, flood. Uh, the same, uh, more or less the same emergency protocols are followed. So I would say uh, uh, evacuation, the basic uh, principles followed in preparing evacuation plans for uh, communities are, are the same, uh, except that there are some areas which should be tailored tailored depending on you know depending on the the, the hazard and uh, whether uh, which what activity should should be given priority that depends on the nature of that but the overall uh, principle 
uh, having evacuation plan is uh, in preparing evacuation plan, it, it is the same, you know, identifying identifying risks as very essential area, identifying risk, risk uh, uh, high risk uh, uh, individuals in a community, like having a, a list of uh, uh, residents who, who, have, who are prioritized in, in emergency and identifying uh, transportation, troubleshooting transportation issues. All these aspects are, are 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 the same the principles are the same uh, despite the nature of the hazard so yeah i would say uh, uh, it it is applicable great great thank you and I, and i want to recognize we have uh Amy christensen on the phone as well uh or on the the video here um and i don't know amy if you wanted to to add anything or uh, uh i just wanted to give you an opportunity if if you wanted to jump in Thanks. So just listening to Henek, um, yeah, and hi to Kat too in the background there, but uh, yeah, I think Henek's right on. The only thing that I would say that's different with fire is that sometimes it's the speed of how fast evacuations have to happen. In many Canadian um, fire events, it's like, you know, five minutes, like get your stuff, get out. And then the other issue is um, smoke, obviously, you know, that, that we don't see. So it's like the extent so I think as Hanuk mentioned, like um, in, at times in Canada, we've had communities like 500 kilometers away that have to be evacuated because of smoke issues. And in those communities, oftentimes there's no actual air quality um, uh, equipment or anything. So lots of it's just based on site. So people start to kind of panic, like, you know, oh my goodness, I can't see my neighbor's house. Like, you know, there's a fire close to us. We need to get out of here when, you know, the fire might not be close, but the, you know, the chief all of a sudden is getting all these panic phone calls. Um, and, and I think another thing too, is that many of the times with fires, it's like a bunch of fires are occurring at once because of the fire weather that's happening. And in Canada, many of the resources go to protecting the bigger communities. Um, and so lots of times the First Nations are unfortunately left on their own. Mm. Um, and maybe that that connects into um, sort of another set of uh, uh, topics that was brought up in the chat window. Uh, Nikki Cooley kind of highlighted uh, lack of communication as as a real issue. That was sort of some of the early points that Hanuk made. And then um, Barb asked, you know, in response to the research, obviously your the time period you cover is, is fairly long. So have you seen um, efforts to uh, improve that communication process, get started earlier in advance of the need for evacuation so that chiefs and councils have the information up front? Are you seeing maybe a little more progress on that? Amy, do you want to address this? <laughs> sure, yeah. So I think for some communities that we're still working with is, um, some of the provinces have started to kind of legislate that all communities have to have emergency plans. But I think the one issue that, that we're seeing is many of them are just, you know, a generic plan that they write the community's name <laughs> into. Um, and, you know, with emergency planning, it needs to be kind of a constant thing. Like if you pick up the phone to call somebody that's in your emergency plan and they moved on to a different position three years ago, it's not exactly yeah. great in an emergency. And we actually had Hanuk, I think, in two of the communities where they couldn't find their emergency management plan during the, you know, like the binder. It's like, okay, right. well, who had it last? What do we do? So uh, it's, I think for many communities, that's hard. So even though it's kind of being legislated, and then I think Hanuk also highlighted the practitioner or the, um, like that there's no paid emergency manager in many of the communities. So, you know, it's having that funded capacity to be able to even write or develop like a localized emergency plan and that's still lacking. There was funding that are like kind of similar to your guys's um, BIA, like Bureau of Indian Affairs, we call them um, Indigenous Services Canada, they gave a bunch of money for for emergency management, but what they ended up doing was just hiring more regional staff that were still working kind of within the colonial government system instead of funding emergency managers like in community to, to do the work. So, and part of that is like, I don't think anyone's nefarious. It's just an easier thing to do <laughs> like, yeah, from a right, government right. perspective. And it checks a bunch of boxes and, you know, 
Henak, do you yeah. want to add anything there? Uh, yeah, I think I pretty much covered uh, all. One of the things that you that's still a problem is uh, having the the personnel uh, who has a full time capacity and uh, be able to you know uh, uh, update uh, the the plan before. Uh, fi the fire uh, season starts. That's the, the main the main problem with the communities, uh, with the communities having that capacity uh, and uh, doing that as a continuous, you know, a continuous uh, keeping it as a continuous process. That's the main issue. Apart from the uh, the lack of you know funding uh, uh, allotted from the government to to complete these uh, activities. Yeah. <clears throat> And we had a question come in from Daryl, um, and Daryl, free, feel free to unmute and kind of expand on this, but he asks if there are prevention teams uh, used before the fire season. Um, so I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe we can start there. We're similar to you guys in the U.S., whereas almost all of our fire management um, money goes to fire suppression. <laughs> So it's to fund, you know, crews yep. um, and people during events. And I don't even know, I couldn't even give you a percentage of the amount in Canada, you know, that it goes to suppression, but it's like in the 90s or more, you know. Uh, and so it's been one of the frustrations with many Indigenous communities that I've worked with is, you know, why aren't we funding year round positions for people to be firefighters during the summer, but then kind of... Um, I think like Johnny Stowe calls it fire lighters in the winter, you know, to do cultural burning and other activities. But right now it's really based around this emergency management response. And I think some of that too, maybe I know Marty's an expert from Canada on the line here too, but lots of it's just to do with how the budget is and how the money is allocated. If it lots of times they're responding during an emergency event, money to fund fire crews and other things kind of comes out of a different pocket. Mm -hmm of money so uh -huh. yeah so it's like uh, unfortunately like well I think we all know many of the decisions aren't made on on the best yeah it's lots of it's just government structure yeah well it sounds uh unfortunately familiar to problems we have <laughs> well we're we're just about at time here um and uh some other comments uh supporting that in the, the chat thank you uh, but again, I want to thank uh, uh, Hanuk, thank you for, for uh, leading the presentation, and Amy, thanks for joining us. It's a good addition to the conversation. And of course, thanks to all the participants. We'll share the recording afterwards. Um, it'll be up on YouTube, so uh, folks who you think should have been here uh, but might not have had time to catch it today, we can share it with them as well. And I hope to see you all on future webinars. So thank you so much again. Thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, thanks everyone. Sorry I'm so late. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Amy. No problem. See you later. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.